everybody's going to rewind and start again from the beginning. And um, Lucia was able to get everything going. So oh, we'll good. have your presentation as, as backup. Okay. So <clears throat> before I almost like <sighs> whatever I was doing, uh, please, if you all are in the neighborhood, please come to our um, reception on Thursday night. It starts at 5:30, and we'll have docents. Eric has put together. He's our our expert on the uh, the Bayou from the Bayou Leadership Channel, and um, we'll have little tours. Bring some friends. We'd love to have you. Um, before I introduce our guest, who you've already met, <laughs> um, I want to remind everyone that our next lecture is scheduled for October fourth, and it's a we had canceled it due to. I think the ceiling had came in at that point, or something like that. We had a really bad leak, and so it's repaired. And we have um, our speaker is Ruth Fowler, and she's going to talk about uh, the voyage to Antarctica, the Ernest Shackleton story. So that should be exciting, October fourth. <clears throat> so <coughs> I love to come back up for that, by the way. Okay. I find that fast. I watched the whole documentary on it the other day, and it's fascinating. It is a very fascinating story. <laughs> and all of our lectures are fascinating, and so tonight will be. So I would like to introduce you <laughs> to Andrea Hance, and she's the executive director of the Texas Shrimp Association. And it's a nonprofit organization uh, that whose goal is protect, to protect and, I guess, to inform, uh, tell people about the Texas Gulf industry, the Gulf shrimp industry. Um, she serves on the, on the Department of Agriculture Shrimp Advisory Panel and the Texas Sea Grant Advisory Panel. Um, she has a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics and uh, she owns two fishing vessels. Awesome. Great. Well, Andrea, I'm going to give this to you and at some point your presentation will arrive yes. and I hope that you all don't mind me. Ah, oh, here comes Lucia. So here we go. We're going to plug it in and okay. go there. I'm going to let you get started. And don't forget to go get it some shrimp in between. So <laughs> Mary, do we turn these lights off? Yeah. Is that better than that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys for being so flexible tonight. <laughs> where my glasses are on and off so I apologize because when I do this I can't read and I'm adjusting so sorry about that. <laughs> I might as well just learn to just wear them all the time and be done with it. is Andrea Hans. I'm the executive director of the Texas Shrimp Association. Um, and somebody just asked her a minute ago how I, how I came to uh, to be at this position and it's, it's kind of funny and let me just quickly share with you how I got to be in this position. Uh, I actually have a different background. I do not have a maritime background. My husband does not have a maritime background. So he actually has an insurance background. I own a mortgage company for 25 years. Okay. Well, about seven years ago, some, somebody actually talked to my husband and said, hey, I found a good deal on a shrimp boat. And uh, now he had friends that were in shrimping and so he knew what a shrimp boat was. So we sat down and you know, kind of did the numbers, but I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, I had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. So, and we just knew that we'd both been in our cruise for a long time, we wanted to do something different. So, um, I, at about 2012, I got really tired of the mortgage industry, and I, I remember going home going, I told my husband, I can't go back. I've been through this long enough. And he says, well, it just so happens the executive director of TSA, Texas Shrimp Association, is retiring after 30 plus years. And I thought, well, that would be nice. You know, it shouldn't be too much, you know, too much headache. And um, I'm always getting kind of riled up because I hear what's going on in the shrimp industry. And I'm, I, he's like, you know, you might, you might do good at that. So I interviewed for it. and. Uh, the funny thing, and I, I still laugh at our board president, because when I went to interview with him, he, he literally told me, he goes, um, you just need to know about shrimp. <laughs> okay, here's the keys to the office. They moved the office. It was in Port Aransas for many, many years. And then they relocated it down to the Port of Brownsville. 
Um, so I have been there exactly three years. Um, it's been a challenge the last three years. I kind of dove into every subject you can possibly think of. Um, and I, I laugh, I was telling somebody earlier this week that one day I was writing a letter um, to an attorney in Washington in reference to the slave trade issues over in Thailand. And the next day I was meeting with the Coast Guard and Corpus talking about some issues we've had with boarding. And then the next day it was something else. So I literally, every single day, it, it, it's a challenge. And then just learning the shrimpers themselves, which they are a great group of individuals, but there's three different, different ethnicities. So there's Vietnamese, Hispanic, and Anglo. So in each group, the very first meeting I went to, and I'm not making this up, was in Port Arthur. And most of the, the meeting was in Vietnamese. And I thought, oh my gosh, I am in trouble because I don't know the industry, first of all. And, um, and, and they do things completely different. So it's been fascinating learning all the different cultures and the way that they handle their industry. It's also been a challenge. But having said that, my husband and I did buy a shrimp boat in 2007. And um, glutton for punishment, we bought another one in 2009. So we are 100% into this. And uh, so, like I say, I, I'm trying to kind of bring the state back together, if you will. Our organization actually was formed in 1950. So it's been around a long time. And, um, and you guys know back in the heyday, you know, back in the, the 70s, 80s, I hear all these wonderful stories and think, wow, that'd be great to be in the shipping industry at that time. Um, you know, of course, we've had our share of struggles over the last 20 years, which, which I'll talk about here in just a second. But y'all are welcome to ask me any question. I encourage it because y'all can test me to see how much I've learned over the last three years. <laughs> and by the way, most of my knowledge in this industry, number one, is from owning a shrimp boat. So I know how much things cost. I know all the issues that can come up. And it's really, it's, it's quite a crazy industry. But number two, uh, there's a fleet down in Brownsville. They're probably one of the largest fleet owners in Texas that um, their son, he's on our board of directors, he started a winter Texan tour. And it's become so popular that he has it anywhere between six and eight months in January on into March. There's a waiting list for the coming year. So he had, I think last year he had close to 7,000 people that show up. And it's a three hour tour, morning and afternoon, six days a week, and they're completely full, about 200 people. So they would ask the best questions and I would sit there and listen to every question that they had because they could come up with some really good questions. So that's that's been fun. So like I say, we we are the organization that, that basically is, is protecting the shrimping industry. Um, like I say, which is a challenge. You guys probably know about our industry and how wonderful it is. Let me get to the next. Okay, hold on. I'm on wrong Okay. So right now we have approximately 325 members, about 175 are shrimpers. Uh, the majority of the members are down in South Texas. Um, this is the first time that in a long time, probably about 20 years, that we've actually had membership from every port in Texas. Um, so we've got Port Arthur on board. Uh, Galveston is the one area that we do not have a lot of members primarily because it's, it's majority of our, our, our bay shrimpers. Um, and I don't represent bay shrimpers, although we do come together and work on certain issues. Um, I realize there's a past history there, and our industry has been very divided, but we're trying to come together and uh, work as a, as a group. Um, let's see. So, we have about 175 shrimpers. We have affiliate members, restaurants, um, other organizations, and then we just have some plain up shrimp lovers or supporters. Um, we have been able to increase our membership by about 20% since I took over, and that's just been just hitting the road, running and trying to make some changes. Okay, hold on. You know, going back, I was, I was researching this, and again, y'all have a better knowledge of the history of the shrimping industry. I, I'm around such great guys all the time. I love going into their offices. You know, at least once a week, I'm stopping in there, and they're telling me these stories of what happened back in the 30s and 40s, and, and they're, they're fascinating to listen to. But, you know, the commercial shrimping industry was a, a minor activity in Texas. Um, you know, and they, they evolved from there. Um, in 1959, the Texas legislature adopted uh, the Conservation Act um, to better keep an eye out, basically, on the shrimp resource. And in 1985, Texas Parks and Wildlife took over. Um, and it's been one continual restriction after the other since then, I believe. Um, we, Texas is actually, it runs uh, number two in terms of our production. We're right behind, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. We're right behind Louisiana. 
But what most people don't know is our shrimp is actually valued higher than any other shrimp in the United States. And the reason for that is Texas actually closes its coast for about two months. Uh, we do that primarily to let the shrimp grow to a larger, more marketable size. So therefore our shrimp is actually valued higher than, than any other shrimp. And I know in the last three or four years, we actually topped off uh, Louisiana in terms of the value of our shrimp. Uh, we land about 45 million pounds a year. Um, and then we have the brown, the white, the pink, and the royal red. I'll be honest with you, I've never had the royal red. Have, have any of you guys eaten the royal red? You have? I heard it's wonderful. But we don't catch much of it here. Primarily it's over in Florida, but I've never, I've never eaten that. So, um, so let's see here. And, okay, the gentleman that was here last week, somebody gave me a card, and he, he talked about shrimping. And I'm, I'm curious if he got into uh, about the imports, how they're affecting our industry. Do y'all remember that him talking about that? Okay, I just want to touch on it real quick. Our major issues that we have, you know, obviously are the imports. And about 92% of all shrimp consumed in the United States is imported shrimp. What Texas Shrimp Association is really involved in right now, we're, we have so many issues we're trying to tackle one at a time. What we're trying to change, and I think it would really help the entire industry, when you guys go into a restaurant, even along the coast, and if you ask if the shrimp are Gulf shrimp, nine times out of 10, they're gonna say yes. Primarily because maybe they are. Number two, maybe the, the wait staff has no idea and they're just answering your question. And uh, number three, um, you know, maybe they're telling you it is and it's not. Uh, but we did uh, our own independent study, Texas Shrimp Association did a couple years ago, and we found that 85% of the restaurants that actually state that they're serving gold shrimp or they tell you it is, it's actually not. So we're working with the guys at Texas uh, Department of Agriculture and some other um, offices up in Austin. We're trying to work together with a restaurant association to make a little bit more um, we need a little bit more uh, transparency in the menus and that's a tough one to change but that's where we're starting at we're hoping that that will help us out a little bit um, okay. ask away sir the shrimp that comes in from uh, Vietnam are put in my airplane most of it's shipped in I believe and and we actually Texas Shrimp Association uh, broke off about I think this is probably about 20 years ago and Southern Shrimp Alliance was formed so we work very close with Southern Shrimp Alliance they're out of uh, uh, Tampa and um, they work very close they have lobbyists in Washington so I work with them on a state level uh, to disseminate some of the information in terms of all the the imported statistics and and you know that's not something that's going to get changed overnight you know I can go up and rant and rave but then there's so many different variables to that and what I find fascinating is for a while, I was kind of my high horse going, oh, I can't believe the FDA only inspects less than 2% of all the shrimp. Well, I got a phone call from the, the executive director at Southern Shrimp Alliance. He said, okay, we can't say that anymore. Here's what's going on. The FDA actually does a good job because they push them, they, out of everything that they have to inspect, I, I don't know exactly all the categories, they do a, a tremendous job inspecting shrimp with what resources they have. It all comes down to the dollar, basically. But, um, and out of, what they inspect it's very alarming and i think it's something like 20 or 30 percent of those shrimp actually contain banned chemicals um that and, and it, this is what's so frustrating and, and i'm sorry if i get negative i try not to be but i'm on my soapbox and i've been doing this for three years and i just really want to make some change but just want to tell you this real quick um most of the shrimp that come in here into our ports if they are rejected for whatever reason so if, if in that two percent they do find that there's some type of banned chemical or antibiotic um they reject it. Now, that shrimp somehow or another probably gets, goes back through another country and comes back around or goes up the port. It gets into the country. Other um, countries, like the European countries, they don't even let the shrimp in. They just destroy it right there on site. The U.S., that shrimp's going to come back into the country. So it's going to end up on our plates one way or the other. So it, it, it's frustrating because we have, and, and this, I'm kind of jumping to the end now, but this is what I'm trying to solve within this entire industry. We have such a um, high demand for this product. We have such a superior product. I mean, nobody goes into a restaurant and says, I'm going to have the farm race run. You just don't ask that question. Okay, so we have a group of people. We, we, have, we estimate that at least 75% of the people that go into a restaurant genuinely care. Now, you can cut a few percentage of those back because they're not going to pay a dollar or two higher. They just want the cheapest. Well, 
in the Texas shrimping industry, we can't produce any more than what we're producing right now. We have a moratorium on our license, so you can't just go out and buy a boat and a license and, and start shrimping. You can't do it. So we're catching the maximum amount of shrimp that we can. So all we need is maybe two or three percent more of the population demanding to know what they're eating. Um, because again, I talk to people every single day and they call me up and does this place serve Gulf shrimp? I said, and I have a little, a way that I can tell. And um, my, my way is I do tell them because this is a proven statistic here. There are people that are allergic to some of the chemicals that are found in the shrimp. So if you tell them that you're allergic, make sure you tell, it, it usually takes me about three times to get back to the, the manager and then they'll come and bring, get the plate off my table because it does, it, it is farmery shrimp. So yeah, so the people that are just going in and asking and they're being told yes, then most likely they're probably not being told the truth, honestly. That 92% you said was imported? Yes, sir. Uh, what countries, what parts of the world does that come from? Primarily, um, and I had a slide on that, and I don't think I left it in there. Primarily Th Thailand, um, Vietnam, Indonesia. Um, and we even take it so far as getting into, I don't know if you guys even hear this. I, I guess I just noticed it because I read all the emails and it's on the news a lot about the, the slave labor over in Thailand. I had to write a paper about that the other day. So, I mean, those are, those are big issues, but unfortunately by the time they trickle all the way down to the average consumer's plate, it all gets lost in the shuffle. So nobody really knows what they're eating, to be honest with you. And I've learned a lot about labeling since I started here. I mean, that's a whole, I, I get so irritated when I read something, I'm like, it's not true <laughs> at all. Um, so let's see. So I think we all know what kind of shrimp we have. I'm just gonna skip over that real quick, primarily what we catch. And then I'll show you why we're, Climbing so much right now. If I can get this thing to work. Okay, so I had this question asked a lot. Most people do not know that the shipping industry is in trouble. Um, so you can look back in 1990, the Federal Gulf Commercial Shrimping License, there's about 5,000 licenses. Um, 2015, there's about 1,400. I think the last statistic I heard was about 1,300. There is a moratorium on all of these. You, again, you can't go out and buy a federal shrimp license right now so it's probably going to somewhere it's probably going to get capped it's probably never going to go up over that i would i would find it hard to believe that noah would allow that um so and, and why the decline this answers your question i believe um the primary reason that we feel like the industry has declined by about 70 percent is number one that the flood of imported shrimp that that's pretty much a killer for us um, Number two, and I found this interesting, the Gulf shrimping industry, the seventh most regulated industry in the United States, is right behind the airline industry. So, yeah, it's not as easy as one would, would think, I guess. So, um, our regulations kill us. Aren't there U.S. farm-raised shrimp? Yes, sir. You, there's, there's Texas shrimp. Yes, and there is U.S. farm-raised shrimp. I was thinking uh, Texas shrimp, uh, I think it's about 3%. Uh, I think they process probably about, the last statistic I heard was about 3% of what the, the total amount of uh, uh, shrimp produced in Texas. And they're fine. I have people ask me that too. Is there any issues with them? No. They do not, they are not allowed to use the chemicals that we talk about with imported farm raised shrimp. So nothing wrong with them in the world. Obviously they're not going to have the flavor, but yes, there is Texas shrimp. Where are they, where are they growing? Like in the ocean or in uh, the ponds or what? Well, it's funny because I just found this out yesterday. My, uh, my husband was at uh, Texas Pack, which is one of the largest processing facilities in Texas. It's down at Port Isabel. And he was saying they brought the farm raised shrimp in. And I was asking him, I said, okay, where, where's that farm at? Well, there's a big farm. I think the largest one is in Palacios, I believe. Um, and then I know there's one down in uh, Bayview. Um, and they have, I've just driven past them. They're not actually out in the bay, they're, they're actually you know, just fresh water. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I visited the one in Palacios and the, the gentleman that owns it, I think his name is Bowers, and he took us around, I was there with the HEB group and he took us around and he was showing us how they, they harvested farm raised. And I laughed because he just threw a, a cast net out and he just, he pulled in some 1620s and I went, wait a minute, that looks way too easy. But they have their whole set of issues as well. Um, they're regulated um, and it's hard for them to make turn a profit in that industry is what I've been told. So I don't know how many farm raised shrimp places are, are actually going to make it. Good question. I have no Probably idea. You got me on that one. 
I didn't, I'm going to find out. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> they waste, they waste to generate this, that's an issue. Okay. okay. And I, I don't really know that much about them, to be honest with you. I'm going to research that now and I'll find out. Um, the other thing that is, is um, hurting our industry is basically the increased cost of operating a commercial fishing, fishing vessel. So quick story, and this kind of alludes to this. So when my husband and I got in the industry in 2007, um, you can buy a, a used fishing vessel for somewhere around 100 to 200 to 300,000. Muscle males, that's, my, that's all Spanish, I know. Um, so to go out and buy a brand new boat, what I've been told, it's going to cost way over a million dollars. So I don't know anybody in this industry that's going to do that anytime soon. So basically most of our, our vessels in Texas are, are older. They're in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, you know, then you come back and you put anywhere from fifty to $100,000 worth of nets, doors, any of the, the bycatch equipment, basically just to, to regulate, you know, get it up to regulation. So um, when we first bought our boat, I remember going down to the jetties. So here we have a guy with a, a captain who we barely knew with uh, three crewmen with him. And we put $30,000 worth of fuel on the boat, no insurance. And we watched that boat go out the jetties. And I looked at my husband, I'm like, well, what did we just do? Um, because not only do you have this much money invested in a fishing vessel, which, trust me, that's crazy. Uh, you know, you also are, we, we can't get insurance for the most part on the crew. They, they're they're uh, contracted, so we do not have insurance on them. And that's been one of the variables of owning a shrimping vessel that I've learned that um, you know, it wasn't in my business plan when I took it to the banker. I didn't realize, you know, the guys that can come in and say, hey, I hurt my back last, you know, last week on your boat, and you just have to write them a check and hope that you don't get a call from an attorney. Um, so yeah, so you send them out, and, and you know, Gulf Shrimping is, is statistically the second most dangerous job in the United States. So, so here you have an industry where you spend that much money on a vessel, no insurance. At that time, you put about $30,000 worth of fuel in it, and you have four guys on there that you really don't know very well, and you're sending them out for 30 to 45 days. I mean, who, who else would do that? So nobody nowadays really is going out to do that. And if there's anybody that has done it since I have, I'd love to know who they are. But I want to see if they're still alive. <laughs> In regard to the licenses from 5,000 to 1,300, where, where did those other 3,000 licenses go? Okay, good question. Some of the people, and there's statistics on this, and I'm sorry I don't have it all memorized, but there are some licenses that people hold on to. So let's just say that my husband and I find a, another boat, God forbid, and, um, and we need a license. Let's just say that the boat didn't have a license with it. We would have to find somebody that has a license that's not using it. And, and I've heard stories where they sell for a pretty good chunk of change. I've heard anywhere from like five to ten to fifteen thousand dollars. So right now, um, working with Noah, we're kind of in the middle. We've got the ten-year moratorium um, extended, which we were actually for that. We, I don't think really anybody in this industry is like, let's go out and let's let's keep growing or let's grow again because we're going to be slammed by any environmental group or Texas Parks and Wildlife and Noah. They're just not going to allow it. So we're, we basically said, okay, we'll accept the 1300 and something license, but when people fall out, we want those licenses back. We do not want them to go back to NOAA because we'll never get them back. So that's kind of what they're working out in the, the, the details right now. Well, they are transferable. Yes. Yes. I don't know if there's any restrictions on that, but I understand that they are transferable because I know people that have bought them when they've gotten a boat from somewhere else. Well, it sounds something like the taxis in New York, the medallions. But you have to have on each taxi, and they're like 700,000 now, oh. roughly, and it varies and fluctuates, but 700,000 for one car with a tag on it, right? The medallion. So I'm thinking 115,000 is a lot. Sounds like well, a fee compared to that. Exactly, and that might have been a few years ago, so who knows, you know, yeah. who knows what it is now. But um, and this goes back, this was just a statistic that I pulled off in terms of the, um, what goes on out in the ocean, in terms of, I, I stay in touch with the guys from uh, NIOSH, National Institute for Occupational Safety Hazard, I believe. Um, so they're always doing some type of special uh, equipment. I think one of our boats uh, has a, um, uh, it's an auxiliary stop. Okay, I'm not a fisherman, haven't been out there, but uh, there's a lot of guys that get their legs caught in the winch. Um, mm -hmm. I hear horrible stories and I see it happen. Um, so that's like one of the number one things. And so they were putting, installing some new, um, it's like an emergency stop for your foot so you can stop the winch. So, so I'm involved in stuff like that. So um, that's kind of interesting because anything that will, will equal safety, that, that helps. Because that's, honestly, that's my biggest nightmare of owning a fishing vessel. 
is the liability. I've gotten to where I don't really care how much the shrimp are. I don't care how much they have on board. If that boat makes it back and everybody's safe, I can sleep better because that, that drives me crazy. Um, the other thing that, that it's really hard to, um, to, to, to overcome, and this is something that most people probably won't tell you this, but I consider myself somewhat of an outsider coming into this industry going, what in the world is going on? Um, propaganda. So I get phone calls all the time. I talk to the media, um, I talk to environmentalists, I talk to um, non-government organizations, and this is what is the most frustrating to me. The Texas shrimping industry, along with some of the other uh, coastal industries, has done a terrific job with their sustainable efforts. Um, yes, and I know that goes way back in terms of the turtles, the, the bottom trawling, um, the bycatch, and I've learned all that. Um, but what frustrates me to death is people call me, the, the worst is like Oceana. They, I mean, the report they just came out with the other day is just completely false. But they, they post statistics from 20 years ago. And so this is back when maybe our bycatch used to be like 15 to 1, um, which Noah just released it about a year ago that it's actually two and a half to one, so two and a half pounds of bycatch to one pound of shrimp. Um, which you won't find, if you Google it, you will hardly find that anywhere because these organizations, I mean, they're not obviously not gonna be funded if they're putting out positive information on the shrimping industry, you know? So it, that's, the, that's been the real challenge for me is actually just to overcome that because I have to in turn pull the data up and, and unfortunately our voice is not that loud. So when you go up against these organizations, they're gonna get the limelight, you know, first and they're gonna, you know, spew out stuff. Do we have room for improvement? I'm sure we do. Um, but the other, the other little soapbox that I'm on, so just bear with me, is our industry does not receive one penny for assistance for anything. So that's something else that I'm, I'm really passionate about. So I work well with, with um, the, the Kim Ridley group. Uh, we actually provide shrimp. We did the, my sister and I actually did the whole shrimp bowl for their fundraising here recently. We wrote a support letter for them to get some of the restore money. I believe they received like 45 million. They wrote a support letter for Texas Shrimp Association. I doubt we'll get a penny, but my, I'm still helping. Um, so we do support each other, and we do recognize what we what we can offer each other. You won't hardly see that in the paper anywhere, but but we're one of the main contributors to um, you know basically improving the turtle population in that in that regards. But what most people don't know is, does anybody know roughly how much it costs each boat to pull a turtle excluder device for like one year? Put it there, it was like a 40 dollars. Oh, yeah, you read that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so basically, you know, those things have been modified so much, and that goes back way before my time because I will never know all there is to know about turtle excluder devices. But they are complicated, you know. And, and my other complaint is okay, they give us these long forms, which I have it on here, I can barely understand it. And this is me thinking, how, how are the guys on our boat going to understand this? Something gets lost. There's not enough money for us to sit down with our crew members and go, this is what you have to do. These are all the regulations. And if you break one of the regulations, this is how much the boat owner is going to get fined. They just, you know, do a checklist going, okay, we've made these regulations. I hope y'all comply. Well, I'm up here fighting going, we need a little bit of money. So if all these millions of dollars are coming into all these organizations, if they really think that we're having an issue with turtle bycatch, which we, we don't as of right now, at least not the Gulf Um then you'd think they would allocate a little bit of money for us to, to uh, update our gear, uh, buy new TEDs. I mean, those things cost quite a bit of money. You know, they're getting drug on the bottom of the ocean, so they're going to get tore. Um, you know, we get fines on those if the Coast Guard boards our boat and they're, they're off maybe one degree or whatever. So that's been a big learning curve. I, we, we just don't have any funds to work with to even protect our industry. So that's, that's a frustrating thing for me. Is the bycatch returned to the ocean, or is it dead when it comes up? Good ocean? question. Um, we had a gentleman at our convention that did a report, and I, I found it fascinating because um, he's not from the shrimping industry. Um, he worked out of uh, a department of Texas A&M, and he did a report on the bycatch. And he, he, in the report, he basically said that we were harming the turtles because we weren't providing enough bycatch for them to eat, which I thought, that's crazy. But uh, that's just kind of how crazy the whole industry is. I would, I would venture to say most of it's dead. I would, I mean, I'll, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. I know it provides a lot of food for the everything else around our boats, but, um, but I don't know the answer to that. I just know it's drastically improved over the last 10 to 15 years. 
Um, and we talked a little bit about false labeling, so hopefully the Texas Shrimp Association, we're working real close with the Department of Agriculture on trying to make some changes in that. Um, this was the report, and I don't want to bore y'all with statistics, but these are some of the things that we come up against. And I'm curious, I talked to the guys with the uh, CCA, Recreational Fishing, um, they're trying to put a uh, artificial reef in, so we've been kind of going back and forth on that, so I've learned a lot of information on that. But within the fishing community, is, is it, are we, are the, is the shrimping industry thought of as an industry that's actually harming? Um, or is there a bycatch issue when y'all think of shrimping? Because I'm, I'm curious, when I travel around, some places they never heard of it, other places they're like, We've, we heard that y'all were just tearing up the ocean floor. So I, I like to get an idea of where I'm at geographically, if y'all hear of anything. Um, I didn't know if y'all had anything, in, usually where I go I have negative comments all the time. <laughs> but then they want shrimp and they leave. So. <laughs> well, there, there's not that much that you can hurt in the bottom here, except for pipelines and, and uh, we don't have but a coral reef, right. uh, I don't know how many miles off. So it's, it, 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 what I have read or, or heard is mostly about the turtles. And, and the bycatch is not the significant okay. From, okay. from what I have heard. And, and thanks for bringing that up because um, I had a reporter call the other day and he was just you know, all been on shape about tearing up the reefs, and I got to thinking, you know, I called some of the shrimpers on the off, hey, you don't, you don't trawl where there's reefs, because that would tear our trawl nets up. There are no reefs here. Yeah, so, there's so I was kind of confused on that, but the other thing I found interesting is, our guys get hung up all the time on debris left in the ocean from, I guess, the oil tankers, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't get compensated for that, not that I know of. I think there is a federal program, but I remember my, our, the, the, one of our first voyages at our boat went out on, got hung up, and it, it ripped the whole, um, the whole, what's that called, outrigger off. And uh, my husband was trying to get all the paperwork into the government, and, and he was off by like two days. And, and, and basically, the shrimpers were like, we just, we hardly ever get anything, so we're not even going to take the time to try and get anything. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's another area. What does bycatch mean? Actually, bycatch is basically any, anything that we catch other than shrimp. Okay. And thanks for asking that, because the very first question I had was to our marine biologist. I surround myself with park smart people. So he's the marine biologist for Sea Grant, knows everything. And I called him up, introduced myself. I said, by the way, what's bycatch? And I, I, I could just see his eyes like, oh my god, what am I going to have to do with you? So, uh, hey, Andrew, you were talking about coral. Uh, the closest are the uh, flower, uh, the flower bags, uh, the flower gardens out uh, about 50 miles offshore. <clears throat> OK, I have heard of, of that. Um, somebody brought that up at a meeting in Brownsville. Um, I, I haven't really read too much about what's going on with that, but I know there's there's some some, some talk about it's it. It's dying. It used to okay. be a favorite sport diver location. Uh, the scuba. The yeah, there's some structures close for him. You know, the southeast lump and the west bank, the middle bank, east bank. They're not real big, but they're basically for coral yeah. and time. Okay. And they're primarily out in this area. Well, some of them are even in Texas waters, eight, eight miles. Oh, okay. Nine miles. Okay, interesting. This, and I don't know how well that comes across. It's it, what's blurry, number one. But this is just an example. This is actually what we give to our crew members, and this is um, this explains any violations on a turtle excluder device. So. Um, like I said, we work great with uh, Sea Grant. Those guys have been so good to us. And, and so anytime they're down or I'm up here and, and we go out and check the, the Ted's on the boat, Gary and Tony, they take me with them. And, and all the measurements that you have to do with measuring those is, is amazing. And just to try and read this chart, I, I can't figure this out. I would literally have to study it for days. But that's what we're giving to the guys on the boat, basically saying, y'all don't mess up <laughs> and try and stay alive. Don't get your leg caught in the winch. Um, but make sure that all, you know, everything's, uh, this many inches apart and, and this angle it's just it's just kind of it's just kind of crazy how efficient are they the, the excluder device um here's here's what i've learned on that and i remember i called up gary graham some of you might know him he's been with sea grant 40 something years he's kind of like my go-to guy and i said gary tell me what's going on with the turtles do we kill them what's going on because i need i need to know because i'm getting phone calls and he says here's the deal yes do turtles get caught in our in our nets um yes sometimes uh the turtle excluder devices are very efficient. And I think the last uh, the last numbers he gave to me, they were like 97% compliant. 
And here's something else that's, that's a little irritating. I didn't realize that, um, and I'm not sure, honestly, I'm not sure if it's NOAA or what industry or what uh, organization it is, but the statistics that they keep on that, if, if our boat gets boarded and we have an issue with our turtle excluder device, there's, let's just say there's not a turtle around, but we have an issue with it, whether it's bent, whether it's off a few degrees, that's a violation. That counts as a turtle death. That's a turtle death. Most people don't know that. Gulf shrimpers, I haven't talked to one captain that's ever seen a turtle out where we shrimp. Now, are there turtles inshore? Yes, I've been told there is. Our captains, like I said, never see them. We got brought into the whole situation because you know, more of a political thing. Will we ever do away with them? Probably not. Um, I was talking to, um, it was actually somebody with the Kemp Ridley Project. Their, their population, and I'm not opening a whole can of worms, but their population is actually high enough to be taken off the endangered species list. That will never happen, I don't think, because that brings in too much money, you know? So, uh, but, and that goes back to the perception and that goes back to trying to, you know, tell people. But the people that, that are missing out, that truly it's the, the shrimping industry because they, they, they take the brunt of all of this. You know, they're, they're losing out on thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year because of their, they're pulling those things. We abide by it. We play by the rules. We get to know them really, really well. And I love turtles, but it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's just an added expense for our industry that we really can't afford. The other thing that we're really having a tough time with, and this may be the demise of our industry, is actually labor. We cannot find people to work on our boats. There are boats in Brownsville right now that are docked in our peak season right now that we, we don't have a captain. They can't find a captain, and the boats are just sitting there. So the other issue that I was thrown into is the HTB visa, which that's just one thing I never thought I'd need to know about, but I've I, I kind of somewhat become an expert on that maybe. But um, we got involved in that because one way or another, that, that program is going to, it, it, it has its issues, and perception-wise, political-wise, so we have to fight for that. But what a lot of people don't know is about 30 to 40% of the, the guys out on the fishing boats um, are visa workers. Now, more so in Brownsville, Palacios has a lot of them, Port Arthur, I don't know about Galveston. Probably the Bay Shrimpers, I'm assuming they probably don't use um, visa workers, but the guys that stay offshore for 30, 45, 60 days, most of the guys are visa workers, so we've had a lot of problems with that. Um, and then we just can't, we just can't find, you know, guys that are willing to go out on the boats anymore. Excuse my ignorance. What is an H two B visa? Um, it, it's a type of visa where these guys can come over from from other countries, and I'm probably not going to give you the political answer, but um, they can come over and stay in our country for X number of months, and there's a ton of paperwork that has to be filled out. Um, you know, they they have to do the, the background check. It costs as a as a as a boat owner, it costs us quite a bit of money to get that worker here. We have to pay for transportation, we have to provide them lodging, there's a whole list, of, we have to we have to pay them so much per hour. <coughs> Something like that, yes. So that all kind of gets tangled up in the whole political situation, you know, with, with the immigrants, which really has nothing to do with each other, but um, there there's some politicians that really want to do away with that. I, I, I don't I don't think they'll do away with it, they're gonna cut it back quite a bit. And we compete with the landscape industry and the restaurant industry, I believe. But uh, in any case, yeah, that, that's that's a continuing fight because you know that that's killing those boat owners just having those boats sitting there and they, nobody will go out on them, you know. So, um, of course, Texas Shrimp does some fun stuff. We get to go around and actually eat shrimp at places. So um, that's my sister dressed up in the costume. I pulled her in one day. I said, "Hey, this is your job today." So we team up with the Department of Agriculture. We have the the cool thing about Texas is our industry supported here. No, absolutely not. Louisiana, all the other states, they are so well funded and so supported. Texas is not financially. And let me tell you why. And the funny thing is our our budget is actually what the shrimpers pay us. We get no we have no grants, we get no nothing from the government. We run at about $125,000 a year. Um, our Big O Texan program for the Department of Agriculture. Uh, Bobby Champion is his name, he's over the shrimp marketing. We have to partner up because his budget is about the same as mine and his salary gets taken out of that. So we literally work on pennies. So we have to do everything grassroots style. So for us to come up with things like this, um, these were actually uh, some um, cards that we actually had framed basically saying thank you for supporting the Texas Gulf Shrimping industry. Those went out to restaurants that we know serve Gulf Shrimp. So we have to do things like that. We were the only state that did not receive a penny from any of the BP um, money that got sent out. I think there was 40, 47 million that got paid out up front to promote seafood. Uh, Texas got left out of that, which is crazy because during that time when the oil spill happened, 
we actually have to fish in Louisiana. Our, our coast is closed for shrimping, for the, for the Gulf shrimpers. So we, we, got, we got hurt almost just as bad financially as some of those guys did, and, and our state didn't fight for us for any of the money. So we haven't yet received a penny of that growth. So you see all the other states promoting their Gulf seafood. You won't see a lot of that in Texas because we're just not, the, the recreational fishermen and oil and gas and all that comes ahead of us. Um, you know, like I said, we do political stuff. We, that was the first trip I went on the boat with somebody here in, in um, Galveston. We teamed up with uh, the Turtle Guys, so we do some publicity stuff. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that, that's kind of the history, somewhat of the history of the industry. What I'm trying to convey to people is, is it an industry that's growing? No. Um, is it shrinking? Yes. If it goes the way it is right now, it will continue to shrink. And we're just basically just trying to keep us alive, to be honest with you. Um, and the Rubik's Cube part of it is what keeps me up at night. Because we have a product that's so superior to any other product in terms of seafood, but the consumers don't know that they're not eating it. That's the million dollars. That's, uh, that's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> that's all. Yes. Do you have a list of the restaurants who truly serve the culture? I have a list on our website. Um, it's, it's a go, it, it, with our budget, it's something that I do on the side, um, and it's not 100% guaranteed, obviously, but you can go on there, and, and, and primarily there are a lot of the restaurants down south, because that's the area that I'm, that I, you know, pop into every now and then, but we're growing that list. So we have a pretty good list, actually, on our website, and it's texasshrimpassociation.com or .org, one of those, and, but you can check on that, who serves them. I think that does them here on Monroe's, it's one that prides itself on serving, uh, yeah, uh, Texas seafood. See, that's good to know, because I have, uh, we have a pretty following on our Facebook, and um, I ask all the time, you know, the restaurants that, that serve the Gulf Shrimp, and we do a little background check, you know, just to, just to see, I have to test it. <laughs> uh, I find that your solution is easy, really. Tell me, tell me. You slot the same thing, regulations and law on the European side, and you have a problem at all. Boy, that just, that sounds easy. No, no, I mean, <laughs> they can do it, why can't we? I, I agree. And, and trust me, the whole import tariff thing is so far over my head. That's why we have the whole Southern Trip Alliance. That's, that's primarily what they do. It fascinates me, though. That's, that's actually one of the most fascinating things in this industry. No. But there's so many other things tied to it. It's just not seafood. I mean, we found that actually some of the politicians are funding some of the farms that are over. I mean, it's just so corrupt. It's, it's ridiculous. Politician. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, learning yeah, that yeah, now as I go too, but I understand where you're coming from. That's the criminal class. It, yeah. It, well, exactly. but, 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 but start a campaign. Uh, let everybody know that. Uh, well, okay, so the, in, in good, good idea. We've done that to the amount. In, in here somewhere it states how many uh, media outlets that I've talked to. Um, and we've, we've talked to quite a few. We've had people come down from Washington. They did the stories. We did an article with Consumer Report Magazine. They did a story on, on the imported shrimp. And the problem is, even if we educate 5% of the consumers about imported shrimp to where you're actually knowledgeable, they're not getting told the truth at the restaurant. That's on a state level, that's what I'm trying to change. Yeah. I worked a uh, long time ago uh, in Mexico. And I had to deal with um, companies that were doing uh, pork. Okay, uh, for the Mexican market and for the U.S. market. And when I went to that plant, they told me this plant complies with FDA regulations. Now, do we know that if this uh, plants in Thailand or Ecuador or Mexico comply with FDA regulations, they probably are not going to comply and what well, that's the way you have to go. Well, and I think I'm that, sorry. that, no, no, I, I trust me, I, I beg for, I, I talk to all the shrimpers and like, just please call me and give me any of your ideas. And you have to understand most of the shrimpers love them dearly, but a lot of them have been dealing with, with this for so many years. They're not energetic. Let's just say that to, my husband's one of them. He's like, you're never gonna change it, so don't worry about it. So that's, that's I, I'm, I'm kind of the one that comes in there and I'm still proactive and I hope that continues for another year or so. But, um, but I understand where you're coming from because um, as far as I know, that shrimp enters, and I know there's a whole quite legal process to that, it enters the country, inspected by FDA, but they don't have the funds to inspect more than 2%. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, are they even getting... I, I know there's one country the other day, I think it was Indonesia, that they've had too many penalties, so to speak, 
Um, so they put them on like a watch list, but still get shipped in. I mean, I was reading how they offload it to another ship from another country and it comes in and it all comes in because our country just lets everything in. So. What's the total annual production out of the Gulf? Um, out of the, 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 okay, so Texas from Mississippi West, um, we land about 45 million. In Texas only, it's about 25 million pounds. Um, the entire Gulf is about 125 million. You're making me think about my statistics, but, uh, but like I say, I think uh, when we categorize Texas versus Louisiana, so to speak, I think they land about 53 to 55 million pounds, and we're about 45 million. So we're always a little bit under Louisiana, but again, the value of our shrimp is higher. So, so there's only a handful of buyers in the United States. So like our boat came in yesterday, just to give you an example, and we had um, four bids on it, which is great because about six months ago, we couldn't get a bid on our shrimp to save our life. The buyers actually overbought when the prices were high and they really took a bath this last year. So they took a bath and of course they sent it down to the shrimpers and our shrimp prices hit one of the lowest they've hit in 20 or 30 years. Um, so they're rebounding right now, which is great, but our production is off by 40%. If a shrimp escapes the net, what is its life expectancy? The life expectancy of a shrimp is about 12 to 18 months. Is that right? Mm -hmm. They, they, um, wow. yeah. life cycle. Yes, life cycle, thank you. Yes, sir. Is there any way of getting a list of the restaurants that actually do tell the truth about where the shrimp's coming from? Here's, here's, again, I'm working with, it. that's one of my pet peeves right there. Again, working with the Department of Agriculture, of course, you had the government into it, and they're like, okay, maybe three years from now we'll come up with a plan. So I know that drives me crazy. Um, but that, I've looked at the other states because my thought is, okay, they're, they're pretty well supported or funded. Let's see what they're doing. I mean, we're probably not recreating the wheel here. Louisiana has a pretty good program, and it's, it's Louisiana Certified Seafood. It's not technically, if you read the fine print, it's not technically Louisiana. It can be anywhere in the Gulf, which is fine with us. As long as you're eating Gulf shrimp, you're going to help all of us. They have a program that they can put the stamp on it. I know there's a whole breakdown of, 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 of the chain of how that shrimp gets sent from like our processing facility to the buyer up in Chicago. The guy in Chicago actually buys the majority of the shrimp down in South Texas anyway, and how that gets distributed. But Louisiana, the restaurant has to uh, supply, I think, the last three months purchasing orders uh, to prove that they're, that they're buying um, fresh seafood, full seafood. Um, and that's about as close as we can get to regulating that. And when I jumped into this, I'm like, well, this is easy. Let's just put a stamp on the menu. We'll pay for it, whatever. You know, it just sounds easy. Then you get into it, and you start talking to the guys at the restaurant association who are totally against that. And, and at first, I'm like, why are y'all against it? Well, then I understand. You know, most restaurants probably don't want you to know when they're serving gold shrimp and when they're not. It's going to fluctuate. Some serve sometimes, depending on the price. I get it. I mean, it's about the bottom line. I totally get that. So we're trying to recognize the restaurants who 100% serve Gulf shrimp. That's easier said than done. Because, um, I mean, the, the farthest we've been able to get with it through our organization is just a list on our website. And it's actually me talking. I, know, I can find out who sells them the shrimp pretty easy. Um, but there's not a, there's, there hasn't been an easy fix to that yet. And, and that's, that's what, I'm glad you asked that, though, because if you can think of something I can do, I'll try it. <laughs> Yes. Uh, when you said Louisiana states like that so help support their industry in off Louisiana, how do they support by subsidizing some of the costs or what? They they get um well number one just the culture of Louisiana it's kind of funny because I think if you go in a restaurant over there and you're not serving Louisiana shrimp that you're mm -hmm. you know you're gonna know about it you know mm -hmm. um, Texas is a little bit more tolerant on that um, but they do have and I checked in this the other day because I was talking to the guys that are putting the artificial reef down in South Texas I noticed in Louisiana they partner up with their artificial reef guys, the artificial reef guys were actually paying for their Louisiana seafood certification. So I'm like, wait a minute. So I call our guys at Texas Parks and Wildlife and they just kind of laugh. They're like, well, thank you. Good try. You know, keep, we just don't have a big enough push. And that's, you know, in a perfect world, we would have, we would have all of the shrimpers, but the shrimpers aren't going to save this industry. It's going to be consumers that actually demand our product or they're actually educated to, to demand our product. You, we can't ask shrimpers to continue paying and supporting an organization when they're, you know, a lot of them aren't, aren't paying their bills. So. What do these guys make an hour? It depends. Do they go on like, like whalers for shares or do they pay? Uh, most like, well, our boat, and I can tell you what we do, which is what the majority of guys do with the offshore boats. Um, usually, uh, we take 70% of um, the catch, the catch. 
Um, the captain is allocated 30, and then he is the one that actually allocates that down to his, his, his crew member. Now, it's hard to justify that down into an hourly wage. Yeah. Um, so we have to kind of, you know, make sure, obviously, you know, a couple years ago when our prices hit the, the highest that they've been in a long time, we actually didn't want that. It was great for a while, but we're like, something's gonna tank here. We actually were trying to get the prices down, and that's exactly what happened. When they get too high, people are gonna stop eating shrimp, or the buyers got in the gym and they bought too much uh, high priced shrimp and it collapsed the whole market again. So, uh, yes, sir. Do you have any overlap with like the oyster business, uh, oyster guys? Good question. Yes, I, I like do. oysters too. I, yeah. You know, and that's an industry that I don't know that much about, but uh, one of my random phone calls, I had a, a lobbyist, a couple of lobbyists called actually, and the oyster the industry who just filed uh, some type of emergency declaration. Um, and it had to do with the fresh water flow and, and the salinity level in the water, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, okay, why, why can't we do that, you know? But we have to, they had statistics. We don't have statistics to that yet, but it's something that we've been talking about. Um, and you know, that's coming back to kind of all, all of us getting together and, and being on the same page. And that's easier said than done in this industry. How close are the oyster banks to the, to the land versus the shrimp? Uh, maybe further out, I don't know. Honestly, oysters I, are allocated to certain, um, um, I wouldn't say families, but companies that have a, a segment of land to put right. it that way. I mean, it's part of the, I'm talking about Galveston Bay, this, this yeah. way. And they, they, they have allocated a, you know, a space. A certain area, yeah. And they can uh, harvest that. And, and like I say, I, I only know about the oyster. I, I like eating oysters, but I've never, I, I, I got to know the guys at um, Prestige Oyster, and, and there was another gentleman. Um, and we, our, our communication started to overlap some, and we're like, hey, let's, we need to get together. And that was like probably six or eight months ago. Just something that, I, I think that industry would be a, a good fit if we teamed up to get something done. So now you've got the shrimp, you've got the oyster, now there's like clams, and then there's like fish. <laughs> and it all happening around here, right? Yes. So there's all these separate boats doing all those separate things, I presume? You know, I, I don't know exactly what, up in this area, it's, it's so different than it is down okay. down south, you know, because again, we only have maybe a couple bay boats, so all of our guys go offshore and they're, they're Gulf shrimpers. Um, so I don't get too involved in the, the bay side of it, and I don't know exactly the markets, you know, where they go out and get to the plant. I, I don't know that much about that. Yes, ma'am. What percentage of Gulf shrimp as a whole end up being frozen versus uh, fresh because you'll go to the store and you know there's just they always say previously frozen but there's always a section not always but there'll be a section that says never you know fresh there's there is, I'm sorry there is a section I, I talk about my Kroger here in Monroe on West Grade I mean there is a space for Gulf Texas Gulf shrimp and yeah. it has your logo or something like that it's higher. Yeah. I mean, it's higher right away. Yeah, yes, and it, it, it's usually a few dollars higher. The funny thing is this past year is the first time ever that the prices were inverted. Now, y'all probably didn't see it, but our shrimp that we were selling was actually cheaper than the imported shrimp coming over. We're like, okay, what's, what, nobody, not even, not one economist could figure out what was going on there. It never did translate down to the consumer, but it was just if kind of fun. If that happened, then why would anybody buy imported shrimp? If okay, I asked that question too. Okay, so I got together with the restaurant association and I sat them down. I said, okay, here's the deal. Y'all, y'all just tell me what, tell me why y'all do this. And they're very honest. They use the same purveyors and they get in the habit of using the same company. And, and it's kind of a hassle for them to go outside of that when, when the consumer's technically not requesting it, evidently they're not having an issue with it. So why would they change? That's what they told us. So, so some way, shape or form, those restaurants need to be recognized for, you know, serving Texas Gulf shrimp, but you know, that takes money. So back, back to your question about the frozen. It seems like oh. if they're out for six, 60 days, that almost all of them are going to be frozen. I, I don't know a percentage on that. I would love to know that, but I venture to say, not down where we are, and I, I would venture to say less than 1%. Because like I say, I, maybe a boat may go up for the day and come back in. It's just not very feasible to do that. Y'all have a lot of, of good um, seafood places where you can go in and get fresh seafood that the boats went out during the day and they came in. You have a lot of that. Um, we don't have very much of that down at home because they're all coming in frozen because they're out to sea for so long. Um, even in like some of the grocery stores, I know at HEB, you know, they're going to get it frozen and they thaw it out. Um, but I, I, I don't know the exact statistic, but I would think it's pretty low. Higher in this area, but any of Port Arthur, even, you know, outside of the Galveston Bay area, it, it, it's going to be probably 
less than 1%. We didn't go to Kroger tonight to get ours, but I have to tell you, we made a couple of calls because they weren't stores that you think. Mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, these are Texas. Thank you. Uh, but they were frozen. <laughs> we had them, had them steamed. But it was not not as easy as we thought. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. so I, I usually challenge, I'm, I'm a social media person, so I challenge people on our Facebook all the time just to, you know, and, and they're very vocal. They're like, we went here and it's not built shrimp. I mean, some of the places that you think, you're just like you say, and I, and I, I try not to blast the restaurants because that's, I understand they need to look at the bottom line. I, I get that. But don't advertise that it's Gulf Shrimp and don't mislead the customer because that just undermines everything that we're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. in a dangerous industry. So. Do you export any, any shrimp, any Gulf Shrimp outside of the United States or is it all bought? There, there's a certain percentage there. It's funny you should ask that because I was just talking to the guys with Susta. It's, it's the overseas, I know that stands for something, and y'all might, it's Southern International Trade something. Anyway, so there's a few people in Texas I know that they ship overseas. Um, what I understand is it takes a lot of money because they have to have some type of a certification, which is basically you're paying for the certification for them to say your seafood's, you know, quality seafood. Uh, I know down south where they process, you know, m most of the, I think the number one processing facility is in Port Isabel. So they have, I think they process about 18 million pounds a year. They opted out of those cer certificates, you know, like, Marine stewardship or Oceana or whatever, you know, the ones that you see on there says they're certified because it costs so much money. You, you pay them, you pay them and you get their certification. Kind of. But European countries have to have that, from what I've been told. Mm -hmm. But I would love to explore that more because when I bring it up to my guys, they're like, oh, we're never going to export. Well, okay, let's try it. Let's see if there's an avenue there. Sure. So I would there's be on board with that. And now, and how is shrimp sold as opposed, you know, like in Japan, they have the auctions so you go and buy the giant tunas or they so are they sold just so is I, it an auction or is it a most of so getting back to like our boat came in yesterday and we actually had some bids come in i think i failed to finish that conversation um i think there were four or five companies um primarily one's on the east coast two's in chicago one's in florida so they're they're scattered around and they they bid out the they send us a price sheet price sheet with all the sizes and all the prices for the size and we decide which company we want to go with so when we unload it at the packing facility, they box it in their box, whichever box, it, whichever company we sell to, and then they send their 18 wheels down and they get shipped off wherever. Wow. Are crew graded by size on the dock? They're, when, they, when they take them to the processing facility, and again, I'm, I'm speaking, I, I've been to the one in Port Arthur, and I've been to one in Galveston, and also the one in Port Arthur, and uh, Port Isabel. And uh, when they run them through the conveyor belts, you know, they have like the fingers there, and it, it, it separates them according to the size, which is kind of cool to see, I think that's, so, yeah, they, they separate them all down by size there. So. Well, I'm not going to say that, but... <laughs> now, when, the shrimp, when the shrimp boats are out there for 30 to 60 days, so they've obviously got frozen freezing equipment on yeah. them. Do they shell like, off? Like, they, do they peel them and debate them okay. and then freeze them that off from the ship? Or? No, yeah. and you know, the, the funny thing about this is, and I still do not know why it's, it's segregated like this, in the Brownsville area, 99.9% .9 of them are, are headed offshore. And then they're they're flash frozen, and they go. It's yeah. a it's a solution, and then they, they put them in the, the freezer. Um, but when you go up the coast, they don't head them, so they come in with the the, the heads on them. They bring a, a better price if the heads are off. So I guess where we are, we head them out to sea. But the guys at the coast, they're like, well, we can get away with one less crew member. I'm like, okay, that's true too. So there's an argument on both sides. I just don't know why it's so separate like that. So. Yes, I, yes, sir. I, I have bought a <clears throat> Let me get the gentleman right behind you real quick. Go ahead. Me? Yes. Well what is the what would you, what is the single best thing that we could do to help your organization? The um when you go into a restaurant or go into a grocery store, demand to find to know if it's if it's Gulf shrimp, okay. and and trust me when I go to restaurants and, and I'm not lying when I say this and and I, I don't pick chain restaurants because I know 99% of those do not serve Gulf shrimp. We all know that, right? Okay, so we try and target you know the, the higher end mom and pop steakhouses, you know the ones that maybe say Gulf shrimp or fresh Gulf shrimp. Um, 
And by the way, if it says Gulf Shrimp, it's perfectly legal because there's other Gulfs around the world. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. But. <laughs> tricky, tricky. Yeah. I found that out the hard way. <laughs> we actually brought that up to an attorney and it's gonna make sure, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, how, I would love to stand up here and say don't eat my money, but I'm not gonna do that. But how you could help is actually just demanding to know where the shrimp are from. And if they are imported farm raised, then, then, then just say, you know, I'm not gonna eat them. You know, I don't know. That, that, that's, that's the best answer I have for you. I mean, but we, they may be not. They may not be telling the truth. I, we have found that about 85 percent of the places that you ask if they're se serving Gulf shrimp, they're going to say yes about 85 percent of the time when they're actually not. So just be aware. You're you're being educated enough to, to ask. Just know that th they're probably not. But <laughs> what is the main difference between the Gulf shrimp? The, it, between like the wild caught shrimp and say it, with the taste, number one. I mean, I, I I was not a huge shrimp aficionado. I love shrimp. I've always eaten it, but I, I didn't eat as much shrimp as I do now. But I know guys that can immediately. It's like wine, you know. They're like some years. They can immediately bite into the shrimp and kind of know which country it's from. I, I I'm not that good yet, but uh, it's kind of amazing. But I can tell if it's grilled shrimp. I can tell right away because. You know, like the brown shrimp, you're going to have a little more of a, a rich, some people say iodine flavor. You're, you're going to taste the flavor of the shrimp. Farm rice have no taste whatsoever. So a lot of restaurants will use them just to, you know, batter up and, and serve to you because you're just basically tasting the batter. Try to cocktail sauce. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Y'all ask away. I'm, I'm obviously not a professional speaker, but I make myself come to these things because I enjoy it and I enjoy talking to you guys. And very passionate about it. I am, for I sure. Am. <laughs> and very knowledgeable. Knowledge, knowledgeable. Thank you very much. Thank you for all for being here tonight. And we'll see you more time. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's Yes. 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 Yes.